that's the override and, and very happy to report that we also have uh, all of our coll collective bargaining agreements done for three years and I, I think now uh, I can offer a lot of positive uh, input on a lot of things that we need to get back to looking at uh, uh, some of the curriculum changes that are coming down the road uh, uh, take another look at our special ed programs uh, all the things that that, that uh, we need to, to really focus on and, mm -hmm. and we were uh, I don't want to use the word distracted but those other things uh, took all of our energy and we need to get back to things and, and I feel energized and positive to be able to do that and help the committee. Uh, you know, not every decision I've made over my years has been popular with everybody, but everyone I can say that I've made is, has been for the kids and for the families and, and that's what we're here for. It's, I'm not here for myself, I'm here for them and, and uh, I'd like to continue doing that. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Doctor. Ms. Sprowski, very quick one. I just wanted to make the public aware that the Special Education Parents Advisory um, Committee, the CPAC, is meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at the Police uh, Department Community Room. So uh, definitely make it out to that business meeting. Great. Um, I guess I have one report just to remind people. I know the um, Uni Human Relations Advisory Committee is working on the preparations for the MLK Day celebration, so people should um, keep their eyes on that event. And if uh, anyone has any resources to help volunteer and um, support that event, um, they could certainly just click on the Human Relations Advisory Committee on the town website. So. Um, all right, so we have tonight, we have a budget presentation um, that's gonna focus on the FY 2020 budget. Um, and it will be an overview, administration, district-wide, school and school custodian cost centers. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Superintendent Dr. Dart. Thank you very much. Um, so what we would like to do this evening and uh, throughout the month of January leading up to the final vote uh, on January 28th is to present to you the uh, FY20 superintendent's recommended budget. A uh, couple of things to start out with and, uh, and then we'll move forward with the, with the overview and then into the, the different cost centers. So first, um, I would like to give uh, a very large thank you to uh, Chief Financial Officer Gail Dowd School Business Assistant Chris Schweitzer, who's back there somewhere, um, for the significant amount of work that they did in uh, developing the budget book that you see in front of you um, and the supporting documents, which do include the accounting ledger, the Munis accounting ledger. Uh, so I, I want to thank because that it, it, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time and effort to go through and make sure that everything is accurate, to make sure the budget book reflects the information that, that we want the community to to read uh, read about and hear about. So I, I want to make sure that I, I recognize those efforts. In terms of the, the budget itself, um, as, as I put into my message, we actually have for the first time a budget where we're, we're not talking about reductions and we're not talking about um, things that we have to do differently because of financial constraints. Uh, because of the efforts of our community uh, supporting an override last year, um, the budget that is being presented this evening is a balanced budget. It is able to do the things that we want to continue to do, and I'll get into those in a, in a minute. Um, and it allows to continue to focus on what is most important, which is our students. Like any budget, there are challenges, and you're gonna hear about those challenges a little bit this evening, but in more detail as we go, go through the process. Um, but overall, um, this is a budget that fits within the uh, confines of the, what the Finance Committee in October at the Financial Forum uh, guided us with, we gave us the budget items. Um, we have worked very closely with the town manager, um, and making sure that you know everything is is where it should be, and so 
Um, we feel very, very good about this budget, which a year ago I wasn't making those comments. <laughs> if you remember, I wasn't recommending the budget that we presented last year. So those are the comments that I wanted to make up front. So tonight we're gonna focus on an overview. Uh, we're gonna also talk about the three smallest cost centers, which is administration, district-wide services, school facilities, and also talk about FY20 capital. Joe Huggins will be joining us a little bit later. He's at a school building committee meeting, um, so he'll be here a little bit later. Permanent building committee. Permanent building committee meeting, sorry. Uh -huh. um, so first we wanna connect to the budget priorities and how that Dr. Murray, yeah. I just want to um, I just want to acknowledge and thank everyone who's here tonight. I know we have um, members of our uh, budget liaisons. We have members of FinCom. We have lots of school administrators and um, some select board members and community members. So I just want to thank people for being here tonight. Thank you. I shouldn't have said that. I apologize. <laughs> So one of the things that, um, for those of you that, that have been following uh, our meetings, is that the district improvement plan is in its third and final year, which means we are in the process of starting to develop a new district improvement plan, which will be starting in FY20. So we do know that there are some areas that are going to, we're gonna continue to focus on, and there are other areas that we may have been doing pieces of this year, but will become more of a focus next year. So we do not have a district improvement plan yet, but these are some of the areas that most likely will be in our district improvement plan, which helped um, guide us when we were going through the budget process. So there'll be a focus on equity and access. Um, we're obviously closing the achievement gap. That is something that we certainly always wanna have in the forefront. Uh, social emotional learning is another area which we've been focusing on and will continue to focus on. Um, school safety. Uh, class sizes, it's particularly at K to two, the middle school interdisciplinary model, addressing the results of the NIAS self-study, which the high school is in the process right now of going through, um, and addressing the capital needs. Uh, you've heard in previous meetings that uh, there are some capital needs. Uh, we've got an elementary planning study going uh, in the process that is about to begin, and there's some other areas that we're gonna be looking at, such as school security, town security, athletic space. Those are things that are gonna be coming up in the future. Those are part of the goals, the individual superintendent's goals, as well as some other staff members. So um, those are all gonna be priorities that are gonna be connected to FY20 um, budget and beyond. So the critical parts of the vision of of our school district, certainly the focus is on the student. We wanna make sure that our curriculum is aligned to the state standards. You will see that reflected in the budget. Um, there is money allocated for social studies and any other areas that we need to uh, maybe shift a little bit to reflect changes that have happened in curriculum frameworks. We wanna make sure that we have evidence-based instructional practices, which that is the training piece for our teachers and our staff. Um, technology certainly is one tool, but there are many other tools as well, and we wanna make sure that we have, that our teachers have the, the toolkit necessary to teach and reach all students. Um, we wanna continue our tiered systems of support. Tier one is our instruction that all students get. Tier two would be for those students that may be struggling a little bit in an area, and then tier three would be um, the most uh, extreme and significant level of support for those students. That, that may need it. We want to make sure we have common assessments at all grade levels and then use that data to inform future decisions when we're supporting both individual students and curriculum decisions moving forward. Certainly we want our regular education and special education staff to be working collaboratively and sharing resources so that we can reach all students. Um, and we want our teachers to be leaders in the areas uh, to share these best practices across grade levels so that they're sharing you know, across schools and across grade levels, the types of things that are going on. Um, and most importantly, our principals and other administrators are instructional leaders. And how they use data and how they lead our school district um, in both their buildings, but also district-wide in the roles that they play. So these are all critical parts of our vision that are connected to our budget. So taking a look at the financial picture, we're gonna start more at the 30,000 foot level 
um, and then funneled down into more detailed presentations in each, in each cost center. Um, you can see that the budget as a whole is going up 3.6%. Um, the FY19 adopted oh, budget. Uh, Dr. Sorry, just yeah. a minute. I think we have a board that needs to call. Um, nope. The FY19 adopted budget um, reflects the override numbers, and in the budget book, I believe it's page uh, three, page four, um, there are actually two charts that focus on both. Um, one chart talks about uh, the update on the funding and how it's been allocated, and then the second chart shows where the money for FY19 override was allocated by cost center so that um, people are aware of, of how it was how it was distributed, and this is reflected in this in this chart as well. So you can see each cost center is, is going up a certain percentage. We will get into detail as to why each of these cost centers are increasing, and, and you'll see that in the, in the different presentations. Um, certainly, as, as we move forward, um, the financial drivers, one of the bigger drivers is obviously our um, contractual labor costs, whereas 83% of our budget is personnel. Um, that is always gonna be a significant driver. So we are currently in the first year of a three-year collective bargaining agreement, as Mr. Robinson had said, so in FY20 it would be the second year. So we do have no <coughs> fixed costs um, uh, in those areas for our represented uh, employees. We also have a cost of living adjustment for, uh, for non-represented employees. We also have some additional funds for market adjustments for our non-represented employees. Um, in the Munis um, accounting ledger that is also part of your budget information, um, there are numbers, those are placeholders for our non-represented and those ter determinations for those salary increases are made um, for everyone but the superintendent that's non-represented that is made in June based on evaluation um, and performance. Um, for the superintendent, that is made by the school committee uh, based on the superintendent's evaluation. Um, so those are, again, those are placeholders and you'll, um, you'll see that several times throughout the, throughout the budget material. Uh, we are also seeing a known increases in uh, special education, tuition, and transportation. One of the things you are gonna hear, and I mentioned earlier some, some challenges that we're gonna see up ahead is, is some of the rising costs of special education um, and the reasons for that. And we'll, we'll be going into that in more detail uh, later on. We are also uh, have allocated funding for a social studies curriculum next year, uh, particularly next year we'll be offering uh, civics class in grade eight as part of the new curriculum frameworks. So there is funding set aside for that in this budget. Uh, we are also seeing contractual increase in our athletic and regular day transportation. We are also seeing an increase in the number of homeless students, which results in an increase in transportation for this area. Um, so, so obviously that's something that we will continue to monitor. We are going to uh, anticipate an increase in our cleaning contract at Reading Memorial High School. We are in the final year of a three-year agreement. And uh, like all of our technology uh, for software programs and maintenance programs, it does come up for renewal. Some of those programs are coming up for renewal in FY20's uh, budget, so uh, we have built in increases for that as well. So those are some of the financial drivers for any expenses. We are also seeing some increases in staffing. Um, as we have mentioned in previous school committee meetings, uh, some of that staffing was hired in FY19, um, and that is based on um, special education IEP needs. Um, and we, we've talked about that, and when we uh, do have give the special education presentation on the 17th, we will certainly go into more detail on that. In FY20, we are also anticipating some additional special education positions that are gonna be needed for our programs um, and for our learning centers. Uh, we also will see uh, a projected increase, a net increase of 1.2 FTE for kindergarten and grade one teachers at Killam and Wood End. So this current year, we do have a larger kindergarten class 
next year, our, our information is showing, our registrations are showing that we're gonna have an equally large kindergarten class coming in, uh, which is the good news. Um, that does require more staffing to keep our class sizes at the 18 to 22 range. So the net is a 1.2 FTE. The last bullet there for staffing uh, is what is the, our behavioral health coach. So currently we have a behavioral health coach that's being funded out of the School Climate Transformation Grant. That grant is ending in September of this year. And so what we are, it will be funded for uh, FY20 is a community priority. Um, a community priority is a accommodated cost, <coughs> very similar to um, the accommodated, accommodated cost we have for special education, transportation, and tuition. Uh, something is, is being done very similar on the town side next year with the two positions for uh, CASA. That grant is also ending in September of this year. So community priority, because it's accommodated cost, it is, it is funded um, as, a, as a shared cost with the town. This is a one-year shared cost. Next year, um, the position will be coming fully, uh, in, I'm sorry, in FY21, this, that position will be coming fully into um, the operating budget. So we actually have two accommodated costs to share in our budget, special education, transportation, and tuition, and the behavioral health coach. We also have some changes in our revolving account offsets. The net increase of this is $62,000. One of the things that um, Gail has done uh, a great job with is managing our uh, revolving accounts to make sure that they're not going too high or they're not going too low. And so, and this is all based certainly on um, the, the type of revenue that is coming in. Uh, for each of the revolving accounts. So you can see here that some of these, and, and each year you're going to see minor changes to each revolving account to reflect that. So going through these very quickly, you see that we have some increases. One is for um, full day kindergarten, that is an increase, and that is because, as I just mentioned, our tuition paying students is increasing. We are, next year, right now, we are at 90% of our students will be in full day kindergarten. This year, I believe we're at 88%. So the number of students that are in a tuition paying are increasing, therefore, you see an increase in the, in the revolving account uh, uh, offset. Uh, the athletic one, which is the second bullet, it's, it's actually a net of zero. So we have increased a one-time set of expenses at the same time that we're increasing the offset. And this is to project possible loss of the turf two field next fall because um, it may be going offline as one of the capital project areas. So if turf two goes offline, um, there are events that still need to happen on another field. So either that will mean we'll be transporting students to uh, more away games, or to other sites for these for these games, and what we're talking about now with the fall sports, primarily uh, field hockey, is going to be the most impacted on that field, um, or need to provide lighting costs for another field in in town um, because this one will be off offline. So there is a built-in amount of cost in there to offset any potential costs as a result of, of turf two being offline, and that's reflected, and that is a one-time anticipated as a one-time uh, change to the, to the offset. Uh, we have increased our extended day, $15,000, and that's to address any increases in administrative and custodial costs to run the extended day programs. Um, this has not been increased in a, in a while, but the costs have, have gone up since it was in last increased. Um, the, the next two are uh, decreases uh, in the special education cost center. Uh, the rise is a decrease of $50,000, and that really is to align with the incoming tuition revenue. And then there's a decrease of $68,000 in the special education tuition, and that reflects a decrease in the number of students that are tuitioning in from other communities. And a lot of that really is, is because we do not, not have the space available um, because our program enrollment in, those, in a lot of our programs are, are going up. 
And obviously our first priority of our students uh, that attend Reading Public Schools. So what you see there is a reflection because we will have less students tuitioning in. The, um, we're also decreasing by $10,000 the use of school property because we, there may be some impact in rentals for a late start at the high school for next year. We don't know if that will happen, but we want to anticipate that if it does, if it does happen. Um, you also see a decrease of $20,000 in extracurricula, um, and that, that is the high school drama, and that is to reflect a historical decrease over the last couple of years in ticket sales and user fee participation. A lot of this is based on shows, and we realize that, but we can no longer continue to sustain that level, so that's why we're decreasing um, that amount. And then, um, we are also proposing an increase of 24,000, and this is this is more of a one-time, and we'll be reviewing this later at a later date. The Coolidge and Parker extracurricular to offset the stipends for the two middle school show. So you can see there's a lot of ups and downs, but that is to to try to keep these at the balances that that you know a few years ago we we said we were going to attempt to do. Um, certainly, we will continue to monitor these. Um, these offsets and make adjustments as necessary. So items not included in the FY20 budget, you can see the focus of this slide really is, is, is the special education piece. Um, there, we, we do know that there are times when there is um, unanticipated enrollment increases in special ed or uh, some extraordinary special education costs related to out of district or transportation or tuition. Um, and those are things we're going to closely monitor and track throughout the school year. Um, but those are things that right now we cannot budget for because we, they are not known entities. So we just want to make the committee aware that, um, as in the past, these are things that we're keeping an eye on. And it could result in additional budget increases. And certainly, um, Mrs. Dow brought this up in the quarterly budget report. Um, with, and Mrs. Stewart brought up in a quarterly budget report. Um, in, in December, that this is something we need to keep an eye on, and potentially we may need to go um, to town meeting in either April or November for either FY19 or FY20 for additional funds. So when you take a look at the, the cost centers as a total, um, you can see that regular day obviously is the largest um, piece of that, that pie, followed by special education. And then um, the three smallest cost centers are administration, school facilities, district-wide, with administration being the smallest of, of the three cost centers. The one thing that I, I do want to point out, um, and that we did not create a slide on this, and I apologize, but uh, in the budget book, which is on page 13, um, we are continuing to see, because of the, the increases in special ed are outpacing the other budget areas, we do continue to see a gradual increase of the special education pie getting larger at the expense of primarily the regular education pie. Um, so this is something obviously we, we want to keep a close eye on. Um, but I did want to point that out to the committee. And we didn't have a slide, but it is reflected on page 13 in, in the budget book. And then this, this slide, this chart, shows you the, the changes over time. Obviously, FY19 is, is the anomaly because of the overrides of those increases that you see are, uh, are a little bit different. The FY18 number in school facilities is because that was the change that occurred um, moving the town core over to the, the, the town piece of the budget. Um, but overall, you can see the, the increases over time. The, the budget increases over the last, since FY14, that the annual average has been 4%. Um, see there. And then another way to take a look at this, another lens, is, is by category. So you can see that, again, the bottom line shows a 3.6%. But when you, when you 
take a look at it a little bit differently. You have, you can look at professional salaries, which really is your um, teaching staff, administrative staff, um, directors, things like that. Your clerical uh, salaries is, is another category. Those are your um, secretaries and, and administrative assistants and, and other ones that provide the clerical support, other positions. And then other salaries would be any other position that would not fall into those other two categories. Uh, those three primarily year increases are, uh, are COLAs um, and uh, step increases and, and some market adjustment increases based on, depending on what category we're talking about. Your contractual services would include your transportation and other areas that we would uh, be entering in some sort of contract with a vendor to provide a service for the school district. Supplies and materials, the, the rationale, the reason why you see a decrease there is we did uh, make reductions in expenses primarily in curriculum. Um, and this is something that we did talk about last year, that this would be one of the areas that we would need to reduce a little bit um, if, you know, as, as budget years went on. And then the other expenses, I believe, includes the tuition for special education. That's probably the biggest piece of that um, in some other areas. So that's where you get the 3.6% the total increase in the FY20 budget. So we'll stop at this point and take any questions before we move on if the committee has any at this point. Ms. Braski, thank you. Um, on slide, it says 11, um, financial drivers, talking about the revolving accounts. Can you talk a little bit about why the decrease of $50,000 to rise to align with incoming tuition revenue? So his, I know that we've been monitoring it, I believe historically a couple of years ago when the balances were getting high, the offset was increased in order to bring that balance down. We. In looking at the revenue coming in, we historically over the past couple of years are actually taking out more of an offset than the revenue going in. So at some point those lines cross. So this is to align the offset more with the revenue that is actually being taken in. So you right size the account, now it's where it needs to be. Okay, thank and you. we will continue to monitor that as the student population comes in and we look at there are so many different options that are available for the students that are coming in paying tuition that we constantly monitor it based upon the revenue coming in. But we have seen where over the past several years, more has come out than has gone in, so that's not going to be sustainable. Thank you. Um, Ms. Robinson, thanks. So I had a question on this this slide as well. On the, the I, I understand the, what, why we're doing the increase for the turf two situ? Do, do how do we arrive at the twenty thousand? Where did that come? So the twenty thousand right now is an estimate. We received a couple of estimates on what potentially lights could cost. I also worked with um, Tom Zaya on how many additional buses we would think we might need if we needed to bus students. So that really is an estimate as of right now because if we do need to obtain lights, it would be a determination of how often, where we need them, and then we'd actually have to go through a procurement process. So right now it is an estimate where we have been monitoring as well is we have one full year of the increased user fee as well. So we also did see an increase in student fees coming in. So we are optimistic that if that, content, that trend continues into this year and we do not have an associated increase in free and reduced, that this may be a permanent increase that we could keep in the offset. But for right now, we're saying for next year, based upon where the balance is and what we're seeing, we're confident that we could use it to offset estimated expenses. And again, based upon where we are in the process, this was really a rough estimate working with Tom, as well as recreation on what additional lights and buses would cost. Can you continue? Uh, one more. Sure. Uh, and I'll jump, I can wait and ask this when we get to the section, but on the, the software and licensing, uh, so we are going to oh, so get that in district-wide uh, technology, yes, yeah, that's yeah. based upon the three-year renewal, and a lot of it is based upon the capital projects that we have done. Typically, with the capital projects, we build in a three-year license and maintenance agreement 
and these are, we're now coming off of the three year cycles for the capital plan, so we're into having to renew the maintenance and licensing. Okay, on the same, along the same lines, uh, with contract services, uh, I think I probably ask this every three years, but uh, what, do we do an analysis to see whether, like I'm thinking of the cleaning, for example, uh, whether we keep that in house or we do that is part of not I'll, I'll speak on behalf of facility all oh, right um, Joe's not here. Joe, Joe and company will come so if I say anything don't tell them I said it wrong uh -huh. so we do that analysis to look at what it would actually cost to bring it in-house and it's that one can get a little bit complicated because it's not only the, the cost that we would absorb, it's also if these are benefited positions, it, it's sort of a split cost between us and the, count, the town and we look at the overall management. So that is an analysis we do. Um, and I know Joe can speak more to that when he presents it. And what we're showing in here, which we'll talk about is what we are cautiously optimistic is worst case scenario coming off of a three year agreement we will go out to bid competitively as part of the process. We have reached out to see where people are seeing some of the increases. What's happening now is since just going out to bid, there are also a lot of new Fair Labor Standard Acts that have gone in, so minim minimum wage increases, paid leave, benefits, so a lot of those costs that are now mandated for service providers, we do anticipate will be passed on to. And, and we tell them during the negotiation that we are considering to keep it in-house so that they sharpen their pencil or? We do <laughs> ask them to sharpen their pencil, yes. And that is always an option that we can, especially since we have it. We do have a portion that's Coolidge and a portion that is the high school and we do look at them and we also, look at how to do more of a menu approach we do. And right now we are not anticipating building back the two cleaning that we cut, but that is part of this process. If, if the service providers through the competitive bidding process can sharpen their pencils, those are areas that we would look to do the menu approach again to if we can afford to add them back, to add them back. Thank you. Mr. Bob? I have a few questions, but I'll just start yep. with the one that Jean had up the same slide, the financial driver slide. So for this one, Gail, two questions, sure. I think, for you. One is, is just for the benefit, I ask this question every year, so for the third year in a row, maybe just a, a quick layperson's under, kind of a description of the, what I would call the accounting mechanism of an offset, what that is. Um, obviously, we're talking, I think, in at least seven of these bullet points about money that is received from students or their parents for them to engage in a particular activity, athletics, uh, kindergarten, full day, uh, extended day, et cetera. And so the state regulates this money. It's not a profit center for us. We don't set these fees to make money. We, and we have to, by law, use the fees for the purpose for which they were collected. Mm -hmm. So just so people understand that, they'll say particularly in some of these areas where we have a very high participation rate, um, people may say, well, I see all this money piling up in the budget. Can't we use that to, to, to address other needs? And the answer is no. Um, so addressing that. And then the second question that goes with that, Gail, is and, and we, I know in the past we've had at different times of the, as a committee raised or lowered the fees to participate in one or more of these, what you um, call them activities. So have you looked at this year anew, the, the, what we're charging, particularly for the you know, some of these at the top of the list, the kindergarten, the athletics, the extended day, that we're making sure that we're charging appropriate fees and we're not, we're not trying to make bank off of, off of students' participation. These we're trying to charge a fee that will cover a cost. So maybe you can explain this to you. So the way you are absolutely correct, the way the revolving accounts work is that the fees you charge are intended to cover the cost of the program and you cannot charge fees in excess of what it would cost you to run the program, nor can you utilize those fees to cover expenses outside of the program. So, crazy example, I cannot use funds that parents pay for extended day to pay for turf two. Right. That we're not allowed to do. So we do monitor these balances as well as the fees that we charge. We will say, so we do, 
Obviously, we charge fees for non-mandated transportation. We also look at instances to say, could you charge 100% of what it costs you to run the program? So one example, as we'll see when we go through, there are still operating expenses that go through the operating budget for extracurricular and transportation. And part of it is looking at it to say, what would you actually have to charge to 100% cover the cost of the program? That cost would not be able to be something that could be borne by the parents. Um, for full day kindergarten, the reason, so we did increase the fees two years ago now, and I did run an analysis to look at, and we do average salaries, and then we fine tune it when we actually know who the people are, and the 1.1 million dollar offset that we are recommending is supported in that analysis, looking at how many classes we're anticipated in having, the teachers, the paraprofessionals. We're also able to look at the principals who do spend time, which sure they might say they spend more than I'm allocating. So I look at overall, student population, how much is associated with paying kindergarten students, because again, I also cannot take an offset for the ones that are not, that are in top day. So I look at that allocation and say I can take a portion of the principals, their clerical staff, supplies that we're purchasing. So it, it is a pretty in-depth analysis that we do. For the extended day, you'll remember um, we had Sandy come to a presentation where we actually did a very in-depth analysis of her program. We'll be reviewing it now that we're a year into it to look at what it is. So we did actually recommend reducing the fees because given the increase in the number of students and the staffing ratios, that was an area where we said we should be reducing what we're charging people based upon how it's going. So we do look at that for each and every mm -hmm. revolving account. One of the items that we will be, I'll be working with both the middle school and the high school next year is really looking at the extracurricular, looking at what the fees are. We did increase the fees, as you remember, um, in the budget a year ago. Unfortunately, we've actually seen a decrease in the number of students participating. That could be a combination of free and reduced as well as a host of other reasons. So we actually will be revisiting that this year and over the summer to look at is it show selection, what, what could be causing some of these. We've seen a decrease in ticket sales, a decrease in participation. So those are items that we're going to look at because we do know that increasing the fees was not the solution because it, it actually did not help in that situation. With athletics, we did increase the fees. We, I'm happy to say after looking at a full year of information, we did see, we, we saw no impacts to participation. Um, we've actually in some sports have seen increases in participation, not that mm -hmm. that's tied to the fee rate. Um, and we also did not raise the family cap, which at the time we weren't sure what impact that would have on the revolving account, and again, we're fortunate to say that overall we saw an increase in the fees. So those are where it gets a little bit tough because you almost need a year to two of data to see what the impact of that is. So we go revolving account by revolving account. Um, the special ed tuition one, that one is a little bit trickier because that really is dependent upon the number of students we have tuitioned in. So if I do not have the students coming in with the revenue, I cannot take an offset because we just don't have it. And that's an area where it really does become a space item. We, we don't want to push to tuition students in if we don't have the space mm -hmm. to do it. Can I just on that? I'm sorry, were yeah, you? Mr. I just had a question on, I was gonna ask about that. Uh, and maybe Sharon can offer some more color on that when we do the special ed budget, but why is that uh, going down? We uh, have fewer, well, I, from a mathematical standpoint. I, I, yeah, I, I, but I'm trying, is there? Is so I can, I, can, I can explain a little bit of that. So um, one of the things that we're seeing, we'll see this more in the special education, trans, uh, special education presentation, is that we are seeing more and more significant needs of our students in district. More and more of our students are going into the, the programs. Uh, particularly at our elementary, um, we are seeing that um, happen. So we don't have as many 
about uh, slots available? So it's, a, it's about slots and not yeah. about quality of... Uh, no, no, no. No, we just don't have the capacity, the space. We actually had one that was tuitioned in that actually moved into Reading. Right, yeah, we went from a tuition bid to a... They're now a resident of Reading, so... Somehow they wouldn't allow me to charge them. Yeah. <laughs> to keep charging you. Mr. Bottom, did you have additional questions? Sorry, not on this slide. Okay. Um, let me get at least one more Nixon and then we'll go. No, it's fine. I don't have any, anyone has anything on this slide and we're bobbing. Is it on this slide? It's on this slide. Okay. So I feel like I'm um, about to make you reiterate some of what you did. I'm f I actually find um, the revolving accounts very confusing. I get twisted, and I appreciate your asking for that clarification. I do, too. And I, <laughs> and I apologize for asking you again. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at the decrease of 20000 for the extracurricular and recognizing that it's for the, the drama department and that ticket sales are down. And therefore, um, we're not, the revolving account is not filling up as quickly. So we need to offset the loss of income in that revolving account. The fees actually fill that revolving account, right? So the revolving account is a combination of I'll, I'll say three things. It's fees that we get from the students who participate, ticket sales from the shows, as well as donations. Not to convolute it, but the donations are sort of an in and out. Someone gives us a donation for a specific purpose, whether it's to pay for additional staff that are doing choreography or something, or a particular, to purchase a particular item that they need. What we have seen is that the number of, the amount of fees we're receiving from the students is decreasing as well as the ticket sales. So I if we think about the ticket sales, those are to, to pay for multiple items. So the cost of producing the shows go through the revolving account directly. So the set bills and all of that are in the revolving account. So the ticket fees come in, they pay for that. The offset we're taking is for the stipends that are involved in paying the staff members that are contributing to it, as well as some of the royalties and other costs associated with putting on the show. So there are two sides so to it. The goal, though, is to, you take the offset to support the budget. Yes, to support and the stipends the and other costs. to the extent that you directly. can, the goal, and the goal is to do what you can that's appropriate, and also not reduce the balance in the revolving account to a point that is, is too low. They can't grow too big and they can't grow too high. So as the, as the income fluctuates year to year, you might have to take action either way and it means you take less of this because of the situation. We have to take less of an offset or we jeopardize reducing the balance in the revolving account too far. And part of what gets tricky with a lot of these revolving accounts, especially the extracurricular, is if we think about how it works as you pay up front, for the cost to put on the show, you do not receive the revenue until afterwards. So there is that concept that you need to have some funding available to start the year out. So we never real and oftentimes a lot of the shows and purchase orders aren't closed out by June 30th, so there will always be a bit of a balance. And one of the items that I used as an example is oftentimes we may get donations. We did within, we were very fortunate for athletics will receive donations towards the end of the year for a specific purpose that we're still working on now to work with the contributor as well as to make sure we're spending the money appropriately. Like that money, while it is in the revolving account, is 100% tied to that purpose. So even if everything ceased today, that money would still be there for that purpose. So there, there's a lot of contributing factors that go into it. And so, yeah. And, and so what I'm hearing, part of what's happening is we're taking our money to make sure that this program still is funded to enable the program that's going on. It's not that we're cutting the funding, it's that it's coming from different sources in, in order to enable it's, it. It would now be coming out of the operating budget as opposed to from the user office, fees. The revolving fund. Okay. And thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and one of my questions was, and I'm not sure if I'm remembering it correctly in the end, and I know there's a chart I was looking for, but I wanted to listen more than look. 
in the override discussions last year, we talked about needing to cut from the drama department. Um, it was money for an additional show that we, so we didn't end up taking that No, we that never away. put that as a cut. Okay, I wasn't, no, I just wasn't. We never put that as a cut. Awesome, it didn't, thank you. So we, is there, um, sorry, are we gonna do revolving accounts also as we go through the regular day and the um, special ed? Or is this our night to really ask any questions about the revolving account? The revolving account, I believe, are the, the night of the, the, night of the, the um, public hearing. Okay, right, and we have, I thought we had another slot for that. Okay, um, Mr. Robin had some more questions. So, let's get forward to the slide. So I like this, the percent by cost center. Can we go forward one more slide? Would, I'm always doing for myself, just for future reference, is taking the previous slide and, and making the equivalent of it for each year, for fiscal year, to see how the percent per cost center changes over time. So this shows increases within cost center year to year, the delta as you, as you go from one year to the next. The, what it doesn't show and what we don't have is the previous slide's information kind of longitudinally over, over the years and how different cost centers have changed. So just as an FYI, don't, don't change the materials, but just in the future, that's something that- You're referring to one in the budget book. Yeah, for the, okay. so the budget book, yep. doesn't have that, but yep. that, that would be helpful for, at least for me. Um, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, stay with this slide. We, we already did that. Slide. So the um, question I had here was on that bottom line, it says grand total. In some of these years, we made cuts, right? So FY 16, 17, 18, where we see these lower percentage changes in the grand total, the 2.7535 and 1.4, right? Yes. Those are like that. So have we, this is what we have in front of us as a committee this year is a level service budget that's balanced without cuts that's at 3.6% over last year. So I just, yes, that's, that's so that 3.6% under FY20, that is level service, no cuts, right? So just wanted to make that point. And what might be helpful is for us to understand which of, in which of these years those percentages in the grand total involve cuts or and what percent cut was made. So did we cut one or 2%? Um, I'm not sure when we last had a level service budget at 4% or less. Not throw that out there for anyone that wants to do some digging. I'm not sure. So I can, I can answer. Do you know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can. I'd love to know that. Because this is my first budget that I have not had to make cuts. So that's not, this is your 10th budget. So thank, thank, thank you to Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for Reddit did that for us. So I, I want to say thank you for that. that. That is tremendous. So I don't want people to look at this slide and not realize that there was some pain and there was a price that was paid for that 2.75 and that 3.5 and that 1.4% on the bottom. There was, a, there was a lot that was taken out of our schools to get those numbers. It's not like we magically moved some numbers around as a committee um, and, and achieved those numbers that, that came out of the student experience um, for, for our students, and I'm glad that we're not doing that this year. Okay. Uh, next slide. And I'm gonna stop. One thing I noticed here was if you add up salaries, the first three rows there, and the first three columns and the first three rows is money spent. That's what we actually spent, right? Mm -hmm. The first three columns, I'm sorry, the, the, the last two columns there, excluding the percent change, are, are budgeted amounts, right? So not actually, but budgeted. And what I noticed is that the first, the actual figures, the first three columns are 83, 84, 83%, mm -hmm. right? Whereas in the adopted budgets, and the proposed budget is 82%. So what a couple observations here. One is our time is our money, literally. Our FTEs are our money, right? So 82% of our budget is investment in people's uh, salary. 90% of that roughly, we'll, we'll talk more about this later, is in the, what, five collective bargaining agreements yes, that we have that, that Chuck mentioned earlier. So we, we know, what the, the payment structure is gonna look like for that investment. Uh, what is unknown, of course, is the staffing and where people's seniority falls and, and, and turnover and so forth, so we, we don't know that exactly, but um, I just know, wanted to note the one to 2% difference between what we had 
have budgeted as a percent of total 82% both in both budgets and the 83 and 84% that we saw in the actuals. Doesn't that 1%, 2% doesn't sound like a lot on a 38, $39 million base, it's 380,000, it's you know, close to 800,000, right? So um, that, that can be significant. It's just something to keep our eye on. So to, to that end, when I look in the budget book, the, the, this is figure nine in the budget book, mm -hmm. this figure. And so for me, just for everybody here, what, what I find helpful in, in the overall is looking at figure 10 for where do we invest our money and figure 12 for where do we invest our time, right? So figure 10 is all is, is the, the master table, if you would, of, of all the dollars that go into our school system. Figure 12 is the master table of the time. And what this figure, figure nine, tells me is that the time is the money. That's 80% of your money, 82, 83% of your money, right? So really thinking about how, how do we spend our time, how do we articulate our priorities for our superintendent and then you know using our time as a, as a committee and setting the agenda and so forth to make sure that we're spending our time in a way that reflects our priorities and that's that's not a discussion at this meeting but I, I think what is important to flag here is just that so much of our budget is is focused on investing in our people and how they spend their time um, we do have you know, and it, we'll get to, when you look at the FTE table in Figure 12, we do have, I think, an all-time high in terms of the number of FTE. I'm not saying that's not appropriate. We'll have that discussion. Um, but the more FTE we invest, our, our costs are going to rise uh, in, in proportion to that. So, um, last point: if you look at the end of the budget book in um, B1, B2, B3, uh, are the appendices right at the end of the budget book you can get the student enrollment. So that's the receiving end. So all this time and money is going in to do what? To educate and improve our students. Student enrollment, both by um, uh, cost center, and special every the day, as well as athletics participation and extracurriculars. There's a lot of really, really good statistics the superintendent and his team pulled together here. So I like to put those side by side and say, what does our student population look like? What are their needs? And what are we investing to meet those needs? So I hope that that's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. Thank you. Any other committee members? I think if uh, people who are have joined us tonight have questions on this section, I'd like to. You can we can take them and uh, have superintendent answer them. Um, and then if we go on and you ha end up having as we go back, you have a question, you will certainly honor that. But if there's no questions from those who are here on this part. Then I'm going to have Dr. Darty keep going. So now we're going to move on to the first of the three cost centers that we're going to be presenting tonight, and Gail is going to start it off with the administration cost center. Thank you. So just as a quick reminder to folks, on December 20th, we did do a budget overview where we spent some time going through each of the cost centers, what makes it up, what comprises it. So we are not going to dive into that tonight. So if fo folks are interested, we do have those slides on the web page, and I believe it is also archived on our CTV. But I'm happy to answer any questions as we go through it. So as John mentioned, the administration cost center is the smallest of the cost centers. It comprises about 2.4% of the budget. We are proposing a 3.1% increase, which is approximately a $32,000 increase within this cost center. The majority of the expenses are tied to um, cost of living adjustments for the central office staff. And as John mentioned, and as we have in the budget book, that is comprised of cost of living as well as market adjustments. Those items that you see within the central office staff as well as spread throughout regular day and all of the other cost centers are placeholders. Those are not definitive known salaries at this point. As we built the budget, we needed to put placeholders in there. 
those salary determinations will be made in the June timeframe and then any adjustments we need, need to make based upon the pool of funding we have available, we would come back to school committee if we needed to make adjustments between the cost centers, but we did need to put placeholders within each cost center as we go through it. So we just want to remind folks that those are not definitive known salaries at this point in time, they are purely placeholders. The other two significant items, um, which again are about $5,000 in total, so for this cost center significant, is we are decreasing the labor council costs. So as we've mentioned several times throughout the presentations, we were able to successfully negotiate all of our collective bargaining agreements. We do have three year agreements in place, so I personally am happy to say next year we will not be negotiating any of our labor <laughs> agreements. So. Tied to that, we are decreasing the outside labor council costs to reflect that. In addition, we are suggesting an increase of $5,000 to the extended day offset. That is tied to increased salaries within the cost center as well as taking into account we do have a new hire within, Chris sitting in the back, who is now assisting us as we are reconciling the accounts, reviewing payroll, doing all of the warrants. So we want to be able to take um, acknowledge that we do have some additional costs going towards the program. Um, Chris Kelly is actively involved in the program as well, so in looking at that, we felt it was prudent to increase the administrative costs associated with that program. Those are some of the major changes that you will see in there. Similar to how we've shown all of the other charts, in the book as well as in the presentation, we start off by showing the rolled up major categories in here. So you can see that the largest increase is within the professional salaries and not to sound redundant. Again, those are placeholders that we have in there. The one item that does jump out at folks is the clerical salaries line item, which is showing a decrease. That is not because we are paying people less or letting people go. That is a function of as you saw when we showed the final reconciliation for the FY19 budget, we did allocate through all of the various cost centers a certain amount of salary adjustments as part of the override. We also have had differences in hiring some of our staff members within the central office. So those higher amounts are reflected in the FY19. When we take the actual salaries and roll them forward into FY20, that is why you see a decrease as the FY19 base is higher than we are actually paying in the current year. We do get the next leading qu question as to, does that mean that money will be turned back to free cash? It is still early in the year to determine what the actual result will be. As you noticed at the December 20th meeting, we did transfer funds from regular day into spe special education. So as we go throughout the year to the extent we see needs in other cost centers, we would look to school committee to approve moving those funds. So we don't have a definitive resolution on that yet. It's still a little bit early in the year. Contract services, again, that is the decrease in the legal fees. Within other expenses, that would be our copier leases, our cost per copy that we pay. Also within there are a lot of our recruiting expenses, so our software expenses, we have seen increases in that. The other area we have seen an increase this year is related to our new employee physicals. The vendor that we use has increased all of our fees, so we are reflecting that in next year's budget. We are not proposing any increases to staffing. Next year, we were very fortunate that we were able to add a position in the FY19 budget, so we are keeping staffing consistent next year. Within the budget book, the total detail is on page 21 and 22, and that would go through all of the various line items that we talked about, and again, the, the largest changes are within the salaries, the decrease in the legal fees. We do have some items that we do increase each year that we know within our consulting services, we have an outside audit that is done every year. We do anticipate increases, that's just normal, so we always budget about a 3% increase in that. And it is, it, we do have one audit that's done school and town, so we receive an allocation for that. Um, 
those are really the most significant changes within the administration call center. Mr. Robinson. So I just have a comment on the, and maybe there's not a placeholder in the budget model, but it always drives me crazy when I see a line item that's called other, uh, when it, especially when it's, uh, you know, the lar I know this isn't a big budget, but when that's the largest increase, and I don't know whether it's maybe not, maybe captured in the narrative somewhere, but that, that you know, there's anything that we can take out of other and specifically identify it, because as we go through this budget, there's other areas where the other line item is significantly bigger and that I just, I don't feel that's as transparent as it needs so to be. So when we go through each of the cost centers, this one was, the other is relatively small and the biggest increases are within the employee physicals and some of our recruiting expenses. But as we go through regular day and special ed, we will break out the largest components of that category. Thank you. Chuck, are you referring, you're referring to other expenses? Mm -hmm. yeah. Other yeah. expenses? Yeah. We do have it within the chart in the budget book itself, but as we go through the presentations, we'll make sure we highlight the largest drivers. I think on this one, because the overall cost center is relatively small, and each increase within the other was relatively small as well. I think in, in the um, budget book, in the narrative, it does, it does say that, um, it doesn't, it lists all of these things. It doesn't s explicitly say that these are in the other category, but it lists all these mm -hmm. other expenses. Mm -hmm. But for the others, we'll definitely make sure because mm -hmm. when you get into regular day and special ed, it, it's one or two large drivers yeah. that will do it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mr. Robin. Back two slides. Yeah. So tonight's word for those playing at home is placeholder. Mm -hmm. I'm use it again. Um, I want to talk about placeholders in the past. So I just wanted to make a comment, and, and it's a question just to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. S adopted budget FY19, clerical salaries, 264,941. Could we call that a placeholder from FY19? And say that, what, what I heard you say, Gail, was that that number is higher than the number to the right of it, which mm -hmm. is the request of my district, because Last year we had a budget, yep. and we hired some people, and mid they, with mid-year, yeah. and, and where they fell in the appropriate uh, salary table was lower than we had Correct. predicted, and as a result, the number for FY20 is lower not because anybody is getting less money, but because the placeholder mm -hmm. two years ago was higher than the actual yes. amount. So I'm just pointing, in both that case and contract services, it is entirely possible that the numbers we see either reflected in the budget this year or the numbers you may see in the Munis Can report end up being higher than the numbers that we actually spent. That is correct. It can go either yeah. direction. So we make a, our best effort to be accurate, but we don't have perfect ability to predict. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we sometimes guess high, correct. and sometimes we guess low. So I think that's important to figure that just because you see it in the Munis budget, that's not money spent for FY20. That is a placeholder for money we ex you know, may or may not spend. So I just. I, in, in, in some of the Munis reports, there is an evaluation component to what that number is, and that is a completely separate conversation from what we're doing. So to the extent that any of the salaries reflected, we have an employee, and that is a separate conversation from this. So just because something appears in the Munis report doesn't mean that it's money spent, it just means that we're projecting the money. And these are two examples where we projected a certain amount, and we ended up spending less. Right, I think in this case, and if you know, recently there was some discussion for other municipal employees and that those numbers are in contracts, just so with Dr. Doherty, for us, with Dr. Doherty, that is not in the contract. Um, it's something that we do every year as part of performance management. I think this year, you know, we're making 
uh, as we've said, market adjustments because it's important and we want to attract and retain the, the folks that we have. Um, and we've been explicit about making sure that we put the placeholder in. Right. Um, and uh, it, it, so it's a little bit more, I, I think, private sector model where Dr. Darty, as a uh, CEO, will you know address that there's placeholders for potential um, uh, you know increases um, and market adjustments. But in the end, that decision is made um, by him on by Dr. Darty for his staff and for, by us for Dr. Darty. Yeah, but it's so it's yeah, a placeholder, it's a placeholder so. versus a contracted amount. Correct. Um, our, our represented universe is those are contracted amounts. Correct. Thank you for that clarification. Anybody, Mr. Belsky, anybody from uh, Mr. Doxa, can you uh, come up? I'm not sure which one to look at. Okay. Um, just a quick question on that point that you just made, Mrs. Webb. In the placeholder market adjustment for administration, so that includes an estimate for the superintendent as well. And the reason I ask is because I remember very specifically in the override discussions, there wasn't any room for that. And I want to make sure that that's no, included here. There, there was, in the override, there was an uh, amount of money that was to attract and retain uh, teachers and staff, it was across the board. But this is not the override budget year anyway. Um, so just the, the w when we talked about the override, we were clear that it was all staff. So I'm not sure, are you s asking that? Uh, my comment is more just to make sure that when we talk about marking to market or getting salary adjustments, there's room for the superintendent as well as his yes. reports. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, any other questions on this? All right, Mrs. Dowd, keep going. Next, we are going to move into district-wide technology, district-wide programs, which district-wide technology is part of. This is comprised of four cost centers. So this is health services, which is the nursing component. It is athletics, extracurricular, as well as district-wide technology. I will apologize in advance. Unfortunately, um, Julian Carr, who heads up our district-wide technology, was unable to make it tonight, so I will do my best to answer any questions that come, but if there are additional questions, we may need to follow up with Julian and get on with folks um, as part of the next meeting. So I will put my best IT hat on. So the district-wide technology is about 4.3% of the total budget. It is projected to increase approximately 6% or $114,000. Similar to the other cost centers, this does include funding for cost of living, salary steps, and column increases for the nurses. So while the nurses are in each of each building, their salaries are captured within the health services budget. So their contractual increases are part of the Reading Teachers Association contract that was settled. So that is reflected here. Athletic coaches are also part of the RTA agreement. So all of the various steps and colors are part of the athletic budget. Um, the advisory stipends and the extracurricular stipends are part of this as well, and those also increase in accordance with the contracts that were just settled. We also have the athletic secretary as part of that. She is also part of the secretarial contract, so her increases are in there. And then there are cost of living adjustments for non-represented employees as well as potential market adjustments as well that we discussed. And again, even throughout all of here, any of the salaries for non-represented, which would be the um, technicians, the director of nursing, um, director, the network manager, those are all placeholders and will not be determined until the end of next year. But again, we wanted to put an allocation within each cost center. There is, similar to the regular day, cost center, we are seeing contractual increases in the bus transportation contract. We are in year four of the contract, so those are known expenses for this year and next year, so that is reflected within athletics as well as extracurricular. In addition, as we have talked about, we are including some additional expenses 
within athletics for potential additional transportation and lighting costs associated with Turf 2 if Turf 2 has to come offline in the fall. Again, those expenses will only be authorized to the extent they are needed next year. We also have some renewals for license and maintenance agreements within district-wide technology. We have been very fortunate over the past several years that we have been receiving capital funding as part of the process, we typically receive about $100,000 related to district-wide technology. Typically in the first year of the capital project, we incorporate the maintenance and licensing for three years as part of that. And then as you cycle through, we would anticipate to see increases. So last year we had increases related to one of the projects. This year we have another one. So once we get into a process where we have a three-year cycle, we would expect this to level off a little bit. Um, and it's also a little bit difficult because when you come off of a three-year agreement, you can see some expense increases, but it all is done through the competitive procurement process that we have to follow. Also within this area, we have seen some changes to the offsets. We are increasing the athletics offset to cover the costs of additional expenses related to Turf 2. We are actually optimistic that if we continue to see increased participation, that we will be able to continue to increase the offset in future years to more offset the transportation costs as well as the coach stipends. The one decrease that we are recommending is the extracurricular. The past two years, we have come to school committee to decrease the offset after the budget because the fund has not been able to support the offset. This year, we are once again recommending that we decrease the offset so that we can avoid the coming back to school committee later in the year. We are continuously monitoring it to the extent that we see an increase in user participation or ticket sales from the shows. We would then come back to school committee, hopefully with good news to say we want to increase the offset. We just feel after two years of having to come back to school committee to decrease it, that this is the more prudent approach. I actually will be working with <coughs> Kate, in the upcoming months, we're in, as well as you'll see when we get to regular day, we're looking at some of the middle school revolving accounts as well to take a hard look at the shows, the show selection, user participation to see what some of the drivers could be so that we can better address this next year and in the future years. This is a high-level breakdown of each of the cost centers that we just went through. Again, some of the main drivers athletics is contractual with the stipends as well as the bus transportations. Extracurricular, the main driver there is the decrease in the offset that we are recommending. Health services is 100% contractual related. That's the only expense that we're suggesting increases for. And the technology is the various renewals that we have coming up. This goes through each individual cost center. We also have detail within the budget book itself. Again, within health services, as you can see, 100% of the increase is contractually related. So that, again, it is contractual. I will say that some of that could also be placeholders because that is based upon the population we know today we are trying to predict 12 to 18 months into the future so this is based upon the current staffing and moving them along the spectrum of the agreements that we just settled we are suggesting to keep everything else flat this cost center runs relatively flat year to year athletics the main increase that we see there is in the contract services again that is a combination of swimming ice in transportation, the largest portion of that is transportation, including the additional money we put in there in case Turf 2 comes offline. And the other expenses in athletics? So other expenses, um, we have had some additional AEDs that we've purchased, so we have the maintenance that we have to do on those. There were new rules that came into play I think this is the first year where we have to increase the number of AEDs yeah. that we have. So there is an annual maintenance fee.
that goes along with them. Let's see if there was anything else within athletics. I think that's the biggest piece within athletics for there. Um, also for dues and memberships, we also have several memberships that we have in there. Um, Middlesex Athletics League, MIAA, so that is also based upon increases we've seen in the current year, projecting them into next year as well. Those are not items we can easily negotiate. Those are fixed rates that we have based upon the memberships that we have. And that's in that other category? That's in the yeah. other as well, mm -hmm. other dues and memberships. Okay. That's in the detailed budgets. So that would be on page 40. Page that 40. was on page 40. Actually, just another question on this slide. Um, so just your comment about the um, drama and the shows and working with Kate and maybe the middle school principals. I guess I think that that's really important to review that and understand you know, what types of shows are engaging students, what types of things are engaging students, what types of things are making money, because you have to be able to do both. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know. I, I was originally I had the question, do we need to reduce what we are doing? But I think it, the, the question is, or yes, we need to evaluate what we're doing and determine, you know, what's what's good for students for learning and that they get value out of, but what's also sustainable. And one of the items um, that we did talk about is before we make a decision to say cut the number of shows, we want to actually do. A, a deeper dive into it to say what what are all of the contributing factors and what steps can we take to right. mitigate that before we go down that right. road. And what types of shows right. meet what specific needs to which stakeholders? Right, Ms. Robinson. So yeah, uh, just along those same lines, my, my question, so we're, we're what, three years into, going into the third year into this now where we're seeing that phenomenon, mm -hmm. so what is the, I see, I think it was figure 26, we have the participation rates for sports. I didn't see one commensurate with extra. Do we have something, that, how has the enrollment been for extracurricular been? Is it? So it's, it's primarily drama is what we're talking right. about. Right. Yeah, right. So, so it has, over the last couple of years, it's decreased. It has decreased. It has, it has decreased. decreased. Yeah. Okay. And some of that is show yeah, selection as well, depending on the number of students that they have, either with the crew or participating in it. But so we that can get so we, we, we can get that. We can so get we would want uh, we would want student input as well uh, right. about you know why is that decreasing and because it's it's time and it's been two years now. So which is why yeah. I say I think poor Kate's probably. It, it, we actually had a discussion about this over the last couple of weeks that we want to do a much deeper analysis to, to look at all the contributing factors. Yeah, and that's part of somebody's evaluation. Someone's leading that, right? So. Right, I think we've got sort of from a curriculum perspective, a curricular perspective as well as a financial perspective. So, you know, we've got what do we need for students? I, Dr. Doxer. Thank you. I just wanted to reinforce the point that I think you're making often in education, there isn't necessarily a linear relationship between what kids are learning and the profit. And the drama program often, often features shows, like you said, that are good for the students to participate in, but might not be big bank when the tickets are sold. So a year in town, or a I'm dating myself, or a to kill a mockingbird, those are experiences and learning lessons that last forever, but they might not fill the auditorium, so the tickets might not sell as much. So it's not just about the bottom financial line, it's about this deep dive that I'm really glad you're going to do and involve the kids and the teachers in that because there's purpose in the choice of what shows that needs to balance both, but sometimes you pick a show that won't earn the box office profits 
because it's good for the kids and good for the community. So I, I'm glad you'll do that deep dive and keep that in mind. Thank you. Mr. Yeah. Bobby. Oh, sorry. sorry. I just, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, do, we, do we have a number on the percent of students, I know it changes year to year, but roughly any maybe survey data or anything on the percent of students that do at least one sport or do at least one uh, extracurricular? Yeah, it's 75 to 80 percent. Right? Yeah, it's about 80 percent. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's tough from this because you, you double count in the table on figure 26, right? right? Yeah. So you're, you're there, counting there. your student, you're just counting the number of students enrolled in each sport, so. Mm -hmm. triple you're triple count, right, so it's 1,255 total, but 1,251 students right. in high school. So yep. obviously there's some double or triple counting going on. And the same could happen when, for we do, when we show the extracurricular. With the extracurricular, yeah, 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 there's going to be people do a sport and extracurricular. Yep. So but you think it's around three quarters? It's 75 to 80%. 70 80%. 80%. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's based on a couple of different data points that we use, including survey data. No, I just wanted to, to respond to Dr. Dog. I wasn't even looking at the, the financial impact of it. That, that brought light to what my question was, is why is participation down? That's what I'm concerned about. If, if, if the students aren't doing it, then yeah. that, that itself gives us reason to do something different. Yeah. Mrs. Dowd? So look, I think we, so oh. extracurricular, I think yep. we've covered that. And the technology, again, the one item that we do have from a staffing change within technology is we are eliminating a point two FTE, which actually is one individual who is a point two, it's not point two or person. So we have an individual who is retiring at the end of the current year who does a lot of our various um, data tracking items with um, a lot of the SIMS data that we, we report. He does a lot at the high school with the scheduling and guidance. So we have worked very closely with the high school as well as central office and we are able to absorb all of that due to additional folks that we have hired, different skill sets, different technology. So at this point we are, upon this individual's retirement, we are actually eliminating that position. As we do each time a position opens, we do, because um, I know we do get asked that question a lot, whether or not we do assess the needs, and this is an instance where working very closely with Kate and her staff and Chris and her staff that we are able to absorb this position, so we are eliminating it from the budget. So that is the FTE change that you see there. There's another one too, right? Dropped another point two for district technology, or is that just a sum? Of that is below a it? sum of okay. that. It, it rolls within. That is, um, even though this individual works in many different areas, it's all within that concept. So if you go back a slide, just so people understand, because I misunderstood it when I saw it. So, so that line, point two the district technology rolls is the sum of everything yeah. below yeah. it. Thanks. Oh, yes, in many of the charts, you have to the you um, add up instead. Of right, up it's instead. <coughs> right, right. It's indented. The top level category is above the detail <coughs> line items. To see who's really paying attention. Right. We tried to make sure they were all indented <laughs> properly. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Anyone from? Um, oh, let me get uh, oh, Dr. Doctor, no, Doctor, Ms. Browski, and then we'll get <coughs> Mrs. Landry. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, my question, I'm actually going back, um, sometimes on a 10 second delay, because I'm thinking. Um, so in figure 26 on page 40 of the budget book, it's about the participation in the high school, high school athletics. And I, I'm hearing that the participation across all of the sports is up. One of the, did I, I say that wrong? wouldn't necessarily say all of them in overall. Total, overall. overall. That's not necessarily each individual sport. That's actually my question. Because looking down this chart, I was just wondering, in, in unpackaging, we just, we talked about how we did raise fees. And if you look at from 2013-14, going into 17-18, there actually is a, a drop in a lot of the individual sports as to how many kids are participating. And am I not uh, it making It could be depending on class size as well. That was that, on yeah. the enrollment. That was but a I, large I, senior I, class. Yeah, that was, yeah. I think yeah. we were focused though on the impact, or a lot of discussion was on the impact of the fee, which would have been 
uh, from, from the last two yeah. years. So, it's you know, gone, it, it, participation's actually gone up the last two years. Yeah. We're, at, we're at a plus four at this point from last year, and we were actually at a plus 30 at a, two years ago for a point from this last, last year. So if you compare 2016-17 yeah. to this year, it's plus 30, and 2017-18 to this year? Yeah, we, we've gone up the last two years of participation. And th those numbers, though, are the total number? Correct. Right? as opposed to the individual sports. If, and the rationale for that is there's a per sport fee until you hit the cap, so it's not pay once, play many. So that's why we show the total number of individuals playing because it's a per sport yeah. fee that they pay until they hit the cap. Yeah, usually it's the third season third that season. you hit the cap. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I hear what you're saying, I think, and I'm am looking still at numbers like going from 216, 217 in baseball from 51 to 47. So are you seeing that in the first line? Baseball yep. Yep. says fr goes from 51 students to 47 students participated that year and basketball 38 to 36, and basketball girls went from 34 okay. to 30. But then it went up to 40. This year. Okay. It, I, th I think it's important to look at the overall yeah. number of students. To forget the sport, you, you want to look at the overall number of students, and right now, Compared to last year, we're at a plus four. I, I would think that Mr. Zaya looks at the, uh, he's here, right? <coughs> yeah. Yep. He looks at <coughs> participation and, you know, if there's an issue or a trend that would be concerning, I, I would assume you're looking at that stuff. I mean. Right. I think some of it too depends on like, positioning and stuff. So if it's a, a hockey team, you wouldn't want to have 10 goalies. So in that case, maybe it's less, 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 less amount of participation. Yeah, I think to, to Tom's point, there's there's probably a specific story for each yeah. sport. Right. I mean, right. it, and and they're not ne negative necessarily. It's just there's reasons. My, I guess part of where it was coming from is I, and I'm reassured by the. Get that deep dive into why. Um, just thinking about when you pay a higher fee and you get less play time. I hate to see kids who love a sport going to a different sport because they're not getting the play time or something. And I, but I'm reassured by the research that's going on that that would be noticed. And I think too sometimes it's pay to play. Sprowski. Um, yeah. Can we move on? To, to yes. Okay. okay. Um, can you go back two slides? I just want to make sure there was one line that I suspect I know what happened, but I want to make sure I do. Under athletics, other salaries, there's some wild fluctuation year over year. My suspicion is revolving account offsets. Yeah. Okay. So this is the thing I say every year. If there is some way that we can do revolving offsets in a way that doesn't hit expenses in such an unclear way. Do you know what I'm saying? Because looking at this without knowing revolving account, you say, what are you doing with your salaries? They're up and down and they're negative and they're going up by 100%. Well, we know that's where the revolving offset goes, but I'm not sure a reader does. So I don't know how you solve that problem, but I, I think it is something to think about for the future. Um, and I have one more question on the yes. next slide. No, nope, go right ahead. Um, I think it's my last one. Under technology, other expenses, second from the bottom, that significant increase, is that the software renewal, software renewals and so forth? Okay, yeah. that's fair. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Landry had last a question. Last but not least. Oh, oh was, was there, there, sorry. Yeah, Mrs. Um, I know. Anne had a question. Anne had a question. Uh, 
Thank you, Ann Landry from the Finance Committee. I had a question about the budgeting for lights in the case of Turf 2 being offline in the fall. We've been looking a lot at the, um, the capital plan and whether wh when to take up Turf 2 and when to take up a lighting project and whether those would be in conjunction. So I was just wondering uh, what the purpose of the lighting is in the case of Turf 2 being the offline. lighting is, so we are uncertain right now if Turf 2 will be funded mm -hmm. for next year and if it is funded, what the timing will be. So mm -hmm. our best estimate right now is that if funded, and we move forward with the project, Turf 2 will be taken offline in the fall that it would, we do not have enough capacity and time to get it completed. Right. So in order for us to still have our fall athletics, we would need to have additional busing as well as potentially to have lights brought on to Parker in order to play okay. the game. So this is temporary one time while Turf 2 is offline to be able to do both. It's not to put lighting on Right. Turf two. This right. is temporary lighting where we may For have to go out and rent lights to bring okay. to other fields in order to play the game. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It does get confusing because turf two we have with lights, without lights, but this is temporary lighting if turf two comes offline. All right. I think we're on to facilities. Last but not least. And Mr. Huggins arrived, I think I saw. He's He's Mr. There. Huggins has arrived. Both logos, that's how we know we're on town core also, huh? Is that we got our core Two people with us. Thank you, Joe. So I've asked um, Mr. Huggins to come and present. So this is, this will be a combined presentation that'll include a background as to facilities, the school custodian budget, which is what the school committee will be voting upon. We also typically at this meeting give an update on town core, which falls under um, Joe's purview, and that is to give the school committee the opportunity to see how they budget for the various accommodated costs and non-accommodated costs related to the school buildings themselves. And we, will, we also have one slide at the end related to FY20 capital. Thank you, Gail. So we just listed our, um, well thank you for having me tonight. Um, this is, uh, we just, this side just, slide just briefly outlines what our mission is um, and the services we provide to the town of Reading, uh, maintaining all 17 school, uh, school buildings, which is nine, uh, eight school buildings and nine municipal buildings that we um, maintain at this point. So, the organizational chart you lo you're looking at on this slide right here is broken out with the director of facilities, myself. We have a senior admin assistant, an assistant director who is responsible for the, uh, all the outside contracts for all the maintenance and upkeep of all the buildings, uh, the maintenance technicians that work in the um, town and school buildings, as well as the town custodians and the cleaning contract that is um, for the town, four of the town buildings. We also have a facilities manager who is responsible for the custodians and the custodial contract for the high school and the Coolidge Middle School. He manages uh, about 23 people uh, within that role um, in our department. We also have a, a part-time rentals coordinator uh, that is in charge of renting out the space um, and um, scheduling as well as the event technicians that fall onto his division. So this next slide right here just shows everybody uh, where the um, square footage lies, um, just over a million square feet of space within the town. And as you can see, most of it, I think it's just over 80% of the space uh, is in the school buildings. So as you would imagine, most of our concentration I I on a daily basis would be in the schools. Um, so it's that's over 17 uh, locations. And we've also listed what year some of the buildings are renovated. This next slide here just shows you uh, what the school buildings are made up of and then the town buildings. It gives you a brief you know, look at, if you don't know what the what town buildings 
we take care of. I know this is, uh, you know, Town Hall Police Station, Main Street Fire, we have two fire stations in town. The, the new Reading Public Library, the Senior Center, DPW Garage, the Cemetery Garage, as well as Matera Cabin. And then of course, your eight school buildings. So a lot of people ask us, what is it we do? And a big part of our mission is to the maintenance and upkeep of the buildings, but the preventive maintenance program is what really drives that. Mm -hmm. And these are a list of the major items that are maintained by our department. Um, and the intervals that we do them on. And this really is what um, sort of keeps us busy, uh, if you will. And within those maintenance, uh, some of this is state mandated things like elevator and lift service, generators, um, fire alarm, sprinkler, fire extinguisher. A lot of this stuff is state mandated, um, including the boilers, to have tested either uh, once or uh, up to three times a year. So that's, it keeps us pretty busy. Um, a good portion of our budget goes to just this piece of the PM. There's money allocated at the beginning of the every, every year to handle um, these items right here. And then within that, when they're out doing the uh, inspections, sometimes we'll find the deficiency and then that's when we can rectify the stuff, so. So a lot of what we do is driven by technology. Um, we. We have a pretty robust system that we use right now that we um, track on a work order system and we're able to have people at all the, um, at all 17 locations, different people have administrative rights to be able to put work orders in and we track our work that in that way as well as the preventive maintenance program. So um, it automatically produces a work order and lets us know when we're due for a service interval. Um, the equipment in all the buildings is also tracked. All the all of the um, major assets, the roofs, all the building envelope items, HVAC equipment is all tracked and uh, aged through this, which ties in also with our capital plan. We also use um, a great deal of um, alarms. We call it critical alarm automation, which enables enables us to monitor any breakdowns ahead of time, so that we don't have any uh, downtime in any of the buildings and we'll get um, early notification, early warning if something goes down, it also produces a work order and will call me or the assistant director. So that's, that's a, a key feature. Mm -hmm. We also have um, our rentals uh, application um, tied into this. It's called FS Automation and it ties in the, um, the rental of a space will occupy a space where we're sitting tonight was, uh, was put in as a rental, for instance, mm -hmm. and as a result, the space is automatically occupied and then shuts down when the, the event is over. So we're not having to go in and duplicate efforts. It just helps us streamline and save energy. So we do use this a lot for reporting and, and everything you see up on that screen is all, is all basically tied all together. So this next slide here just gives you an idea where, um, where the work is going. Um, it fluctuated between, um, in 2018, there was uh, 2,448 work orders and then 2017, I think that says 2,598. But you can see um, that over the last two years, it's pretty close as far as where the workflow is going and where we're spending our time at the different locations. All right, you got me. I'm not colorblind, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. I meant to trick you. Which, <laughs> on RMHS, just which is the, um, F, F, FY18 is the top, uh, FY17 is the top. Is the top is always the Correct. The top is the current. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes you, if you look at, you might, you might, it, 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 it can depend. There's, there's, it could be a spike one year yeah. from over another year. Right. It depends. Everything is tracked through this. This isn't just maintenance work orders. This is everything we do. Oh. We track. Okay. It could be even. It could be delivering supplies. It could be doing anything. Um, so they do fluctuate, but I'd say more than 75 to 80 percent of this is actual facilities-related stuff. But we track it so that our guys can put, because our guys also track their time through this program, so we can see where the, where the time is being allocated for the technicians. So this next slide here, um, we added a, uh, a fourth maintenance person in 2017, a uh, master carpenter. And if you look at this, what we've, by doing that, what we've been able to do is free up our electrician and our plumber to do more of their trade. 
So uh, if, if you look at the assignment, in-house total in 17 was 73% and 27 was outsourced, and it's about the same again this year. So these, the amount that we're doing that we're outsourcing could improve if we were able to possibly hire an HVAC technician, but the market the way it is right now, it's something we've toyed around with uh, in speaking with the town manager, adding an HVAC technician. But because we have so many different types of equipment, it's difficult to find someone with the skill set to be able to do everything we have. So it remains more cost effective to have that piece outsourced, if you will. So, but we're always looking to do more and more in-house. We do small build-outs and things like that in-house, pump replacements. Our guys, um, we just knew, did new hot water boiler over at the Coolidge Middle School as part of the capital plan, and we did all the electrical and all the gas piping in-house. We saved a lot of money by doing that. But having that fourth person enables those two guys to go out and do a lot of the diagnosing of issues related to HVAC before we have to pick up the phone and call the outside vendors. Yeah. Can I just, Joe? Just to the, go back to that, to that point, uh, I, is that 27%? I can't yeah. Yes. So is that, is that, would you say that, I think to that point, that's mostly HVAC work? That's, um, or nope, it could be, uh, this, I'll give you an example of stuff we can't, we can't do. Um, we can do some HVAC work with an in-house, and we do, we have a plumber also. Elevator service is something we can't touch. For instance, controls is something we don't touch in-house. Um, things as simple as like grease trap maintenance, um, fire suppression, fire extinguishers, so and things like that. There's a lot of stuff. There is a lot of stuff, but that's, um, that's pretty good considering the size of the department we are and how much we do outsource. So. So this next slide here will just, it just goes through uh, and shows everybody what our electrical usage uh, in kilowatt hours by square foot is. And if you go across the board, you can see where the, um, the consumption is. If you look at the schools, they pretty much are performing pretty close, wood end school. You'd expect it is a little bit higher, and that's because that building, the way it's designed, it has a lot of electric, a large, large fan air moving equipment in that building whereas most of the other buildings have hydronic and they do have air moving equipment in there, but these large air handlers that move all the air around to provide heat in that building. And if you go down, and this is also driven by weather, it can be, it's driven by weather. If you go down at the end, you can look at the PD, the Main Street Fire Station, um, those locations, they're public safety buildings, and you'd expect that, 24 seven operation. And again, this next slide will show you a similar type of thing as far as natural gas in uh, therms per square foot. Um, going all the way down to the end of the line, you look at the DPW garage, and a lot of that is, is weather driven because of the activity that's down there, okay? So if you have a tough winter, you're gonna be having a building that's gonna be occupied 24 seven sometimes for multiple days in a row with vehicles coming in and out of the high bay garage down there, so. We have done some things to minimize that um, by um, adding more uh, automatic door timers on the overhead doors down there to keep the doors to come down automatically after like a minute and a half, two minutes. Sorry. Yep, hold on, Ms. Robinson. Hey, I may have asked you this at, at the last time you presented, but has, we, when we did the energy performance contracting, what was that? Five years ago now, ten, ten years ago. It was 2009. All right. Yeah. So, has that? Have we gotten all the uses out of that at this point, or is there anything else we can do based yeah, on those? We did talk about that. Um, so, when they when they came out and looked at our buildings, they looked at they did a baseline analysis of where we were spending, where our consumption was going in the buildings, and consistently over the last nine years, we have exceeded the savings that they guarantee. So um, that's based on them looking at doing something called measurement and verification. They analyze and they take all utility bills once a year, we send everything to them in our maintenance records. And they do that to make sure that we're number one, maintaining our equipment per manufacturer's recommendations. Um, and that we're meeting the savings and it's an overall savings. It's between all three commodities. Uh, electricity, water, and natural gas. 
um, when we did the project, the, the big thing was the LED lighting was too expensive. Right. So now the prices have gone down substantially on LED lighting, and we did uh, a big LED lighting project uh, in all the common areas over at the Eaton two years ago. Mm -hmm. We replaced all those with new LED fixtures. We did that through a rebate through RMLD. Um, we also have done, um, that was at the Eaton, we did some at Birch Meadow this, uh, like three months ago, I think it was, we did Birch Meadow in some common area um, with the, the LEDs actually cheaper than the uh, fluorescent fixtures that are over there. The next one we'd like to move on to is possibly the field house here at the high school, which is a huge it's energy, uh, be a huge energy savings. So we're always looking at new stuff. If I was gonna do another project, we were gonna do it, enter into something like that, it would be LED, LEDs. Thank you. So this slide shows the um, water and sewer usage in gallons per square foot. And at the bottom there's a little note there that coolage and the wood end both have irrigation systems. Okay, so that's why they are a little higher. Yeah, really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's three cost centers that the facilities department uh, manages. One is this, which we're gonna talk about right now, which is the school facilities cost center, which um, is basically all the school custodians, the cleaning contract, and the supplies associated with doing the cleaning, as well as uh, some managerial staff. Then we have the core facilities department, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, but that is to maintain all the buildings with the uh, utilities, the maintenance technician, and all the outside contracts. And then the third one, which we won't go into, but it is for the town, and it's the town custodians, the cleaning contract for the town, as well as the supplies associated with doing the cleaning of those buildings. Under the school facilities cost center, um, the recommended budget for FY20 is 1,388,844. Uh, it's an overall increase of 4.8% across that. Uh, and this includes cost of living adjustments, salary, um, column increases, which is per the union contract. We have uh, the union agreement. Um, there's an anticipated increase in the, in the contract cleaning service here at the high school, as well as the Coolidge Middle School. Um, this will be going out to bid in our next fiscal year. Um, there is, we are being told there is gonna be an increase in that, which we'll talk about. Uh, we are gonna put that out to competitive bid, and our hope is to come in at, in, le with le in less money than, than we're asking, than we're showing you right here. The last two items on there are the ones that we discussed, which is the increase in the revolving account offset coming from extended day, and that partially is due to the increased labor costs, supply costs, um, and potentially the cleaning contract going forward. And then as of right now, we do not fully know if there will be an impact related to late start, but we have heard that there may be an impact to some of the renters, so in order to be prudent, we are recommending a decrease in the offset. If we do not see a decrease in the rentals, we would then come back to school committee and reestablish it, but rather than bank on it, we thought it would be better to reflect a potential decrease in there. So this next slide here, um, if you're looking at the FY20 budget, the professional salaries are um, up 1.4%, clerical up 1.7%, other salaries up 1.9%. The contract service one is the big one, that's the 15% increase that we just talked about a minute ago. Supplies and materials are up 0.6% and other expenses is up 21% and that's for an agreement that we have with um, some of our outside contracts for mop cleaning as well as replacing some aged equipment that we have in district. And again, that number, that 15% placeholder that we have in there, we are gonna put it out for competitive bid. That's just a quick question, so along the lines of Ms. Borowski, so the to the offsets, um, offset each other. They the do. Changes. Yes. Um, but where do they, are they in different line items? So if you look at figure 30. They are all within the other salaries line item. They are always in the other salaries line item. Okay. So the other salaries line item includes the 
custodial yeah. contract as well as overtime and substitutes. Oh, revolving funds. Right. And revolving yeah. funds are because that's where the bulk of, of the offset would go for that between the two accounts. Okay. So, so it is currently a net. Right. No one. Right. It didn't change from right. FY19. Um, and can I, just before we move on, can I just ask one question? I'm sorry, back to slide 42. Uh, 42. I'm just sort of curious, Coolidge, uh, I know this really isn't budget, but the gas usage um, is, right, 0.797. The other schools are all around 0.5 or less. Um, Which one you know, is it? What is it? And I'm just sort of wondering, is that, is that something different about Coolidge as a building? Or, I mean, may maybe it's wrong to compare it to the other. Because it has two stars. Um, it could have something to do with the fact that we have a building that was, uh, when it was renovated, um, they added a hydronic system to the back part of the building. So maybe 20% of the building has a, so we have two steam boilers in the building, yeah. okay? And the, um, there's a, there's, a, there's a converter to convert the steam to hot water to heat the back of the building. It's not the most efficient way to do it. Right. All right, so that could, have a, that could have an impact on it over there. It could have to do with usage in the building also. Right, because rentals. You know, rentals does impact that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And there is no recommendation for staffing change. Yep. Right. Is everyone good with school facilities? If so, we can move on to just... Ms. Borowski. I have one. Um, so on the water usage, clearly the irrigation systems are a driver. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that can be done to manage that to lower the water usage of those two schools? They're all on timers, I know that. That's more, more or less managed by DPW as far as when they come on and when they go. They don't run them excessively, I can tell you that. Um. Okay, thank you. Oh, hi, Mr. Bottom. <coughs> Joe, I see in your slide, if you go back two slides, I think, to the dollar stamp, the actual versus adopted FY19. <coughs> And the requested budget 20. I'm just curious to the FY19, Joe, if you have any sense of are we tracking to the estimated number this year? And do you have you know, a high, high degree of confidence in the, the budget request for FY20 being appropriate? So I can jump in part of that because part of that was. So as we did with each of the cost centers, as part of the override part, we since we had not settled any of the contracts, Right. We put placeholders in for each of the cost centers. <coughs> so depending upon where the contracts were settled, we may not have utilized that allocation within the cost center, which is artificially bringing the pro next year in. I will say from a trending perspective, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, for the FY19, our salary will also be lower than that because we do have instances in which we have individuals who are out for varying reasons that may be paid or unpaid leave. So our salary budget is trending lower than anticipated this year due to that. So is, have we updated the FY20 to be the, the best, most current estimate based on those considerations? The FY20 budget is based upon known existing staff as of the date we did the budget moved along the spectrum of their agreement, yes. We have the small, we budget for small, and we have that's the other thing. The other part, one of the other items that we did increase next year's budget based upon how we're trending this year is overtime and substitutes to cover because as we have individuals who get more vacation time, we try to backfill. We don't backfill 100%, but we do have to fill those shifts um, as well as when we do have, which it gets a little bit difficult when we do have storms and such where we have to have all shifts come in where we're paying some of the overtime. So this is based upon best information we have today. So if we have people leave and we hire them at a higher step than they currently add, it would it would alter 
Wait, that overtime is in the professional salaries number. That's all in the salaries number? The overtime is, is within in the other salaries. Other salaries. The professional oh, salaries. salaries is um, the custodial manager. Oh, okay, right, other salaries. On table, figure 30. Thank you. Is that it, Nick, for now? All right, so then this is just for our information. This is, this is high not level part of our budget. For information, this right. is not part of the budget, but since it does impact the school, this is typically mm -hmm. the update Joe gives each year. Right. Don't Thank you. John, we still, yeah, Mr. Robinson. we still vote on the, the not, not, not on the town floor, though. Sorry, um, Mr. Berman, sorry. This is yeah. okay. Thank you, Barry Berman, member of the select board. Joe, can you talk a little bit about how you work with the permanent building committee, um, both on the town buildings, but also on the school to sort of get a baseline condition of, yep. the, of, the, of the property, so then it's easily maybe Predi more predictable for capital improvements that you need down the road, and I know it's probably a moving target, but, but can you estimate some kind of a cost saving by having a group like that helping out and, and, and sort of being proactive rather than waiting for something to fall apart? Okay. So um, I was just at the Permanent Building Committee meeting before I came over here. We were at, we're at Barrows, and we have gone through so far um, the Killam. Uh, we've gone through the... Um, Birch Meadow and uh, Eaton, and now we're at Barrows, and um, so we still have the, re the remaining schools. We've gone through as a facilities department and done the assessment tool that they've developed, and we've actually gone through and assessed the buildings on our behalf, and we gave our own rankings of all the conditions of all eight school buildings. So what they're doing now is they're going through and they're looking at them from the same standpoint we are, except they're, you know, we're comparing notes, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's the the process has been, it's it's pretty involved because there's a lot to look at. It's looking at everything from site to the uh, and the and the inside of the building and every building system you can think of. So the um, we talked about that tonight. It's funny you said that. We talked about. Um, how this kind of plays in with the capital plan. The good news is, is that um, they haven't had any, um, I'll call them oh my God moments in the buildings, mm -hmm. which is good. Um, so <laughs> they are, they, they are, they're very supportive of what we do, what our mission is, I can tell you that. I think that they're happy with the way they, the buildings are maintained. It's their job to find things and they do, and they've made recommendations. Um, nothing that they've brought to our attention is stuff that we don't know about as of as of yet. Um, the goal would be to them, you know, they're looking at it at, in a point at a, at a point in time right now. So like they're going to look at the buildings now, and they're going to go through and assess all the school buildings, and then we'll hit all the town buildings. Once they're done doing that, then we'll have a, a snapshot in time of where we are right now, if you will, and then that is you. They're going to be they're comparing that to what we have in the capital plan. Thankfully, what we have in the capital plan is we're all looking at the same thing, if you will. And the ranking um, of certain buildings w would be as you would expect. Um, the buildings are in good shape. Um, some of them uh, need attention, and we know which ones they are um, on school and town side. Um, but the goal is to have them as a resource to us. We didn't have that before during other building projects. Um, we uh, anticipate when the torch gets hand off, so to speak, and we have a project in play, that that's when they're really gonna be uh, uh, of great use to us. But getting through the schools and the town buildings is, is, is a task. So we are working with them. We meet once a month with them. We're in Barrows today. Right now they're walking that building. We're planning on hitting Wood End next. And then after that will be Parker, Coolidge, and then the high school, so. Um, Can I just, but just for clarification, this is more, um, a little bit more focused on sort of capital condition, although. It's looking at everything. It's looking at, yes it is. But it, so they may identify something and say, and be asking sort of, what's your preventative maintenance routine We've given them, around yes. this? 
Yeah. So yeah, so one of the things that they had us give them was a, a list of all of the inventory, at asset inventory for all the equipment of all the buildings, and then we used the assessment tool and we gave it our own ranking, if you will, like four being five being the best, four one being the the worst, and we went through and ranked it. Um, and then we've also aged all the equipment. So all of our equipment's all aged. We know when it should be replaced or we, based on industry standards and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it kind of all ties out into the capital plan. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Doxer. How does, I, I'm so impressed um, that you're th so thorough and I'm so thrilled that we have this permanent building committee because I remember vividly when we didn't. Um, I'm wondering in terms of the school building assistance program, will this committee be helping to write the grants, to write the applications? Will the assessment tool align with it? No, no it's just I, completely I internal think the tool, to read. The, the assessment tool can be used by the superintendent's office right. as, mm -hmm. as information for to the give to the MSBA. So it'll Does inform the yes, that's a, that's applications. A different yeah, totally. that's different it would, altogether. That would be if we ever got to that point where we had a building project that we were going through all the various steps. If we were going to seek MSBA funding, that would be an internal process that we would utilize yeah. that right. information yeah. pulled together as part of it, but they would not be mm. actively involved in completing all of the okay. Thank you. checklists and forms. So this uh, slide here just shows you where um, the changes are uh, in, in the town facilities budget. Again, we talked about what that includes. Core facilities um, is up 3.76%. Um, you go down and you can look at the salary lines for town facilities, core facilities, and the school buildings, which we just talked about, okay? Um, I don't know if you really want to talk too much about town buildings, but the electricity, you can look at the electricity increase, percentage change is 3.95% for electricity, 4% for natural gas, and 5% for water and sewer. And again, this next slide just goes into a little bit more, um, a little more depth as to where the actual money is going in the different lines. And the one you'd be most interested in um, would be the school, the school's cost breakdown, okay, which is this next slide right here. And this shows you where the money is allocated for the school buildings in terms of the expenses and the accommodated costs. Under other maintenance and repair, you see that line is up 77%, and that's to, um, that's additional money that was put in the budget um, for things like turf field maintenance is in there, mm -hmm. um, uh, overtime, um, we are asking for additional overtime to cover uh, breakdowns as well as snow removal and things like that. Um, uh, ice melt is in there architectural fees, which we use architects to do design work and things like that. That's why that line is up. And even though we are moving forward with looking at the analysis for Turf 2, there are additional other fields that we are still maintaining. So even if Turf mm -hmm. 2, that project does move forward, we do still have the stadium, we do still have the track, and we still have the field Park. house. So this is not, this line item will not go away if Turf 2 is replaced because we are we still maintaining them, yeah. Core is still maintaining all of the other fields as well. And it's critical to make sure we're not underfunding that because mm -hmm. that just puts us in a position that we don't want to be in. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Doxer. Um, on that same idea of underfunding, I have two questions, and I, I'm, they won't apply to 2020, but I'm just wondering, in terms of long-term thinking about some of these costs, are we looking into solar at all in terms to, of offsetting some of the costs long-term? And then the second question is about the lights on Parker. If, if we find that we have to get to that, will they 
look at the difference in cost between putting something permanent in and maybe solar versus a temporary fix and what the difference are you talking to are you talking solar across the board at all town at all school buildings are you talking not no just incrementally if there's a plan so over time well, to bring in solar as we need so the the money that we put into the operating budget for the lights is temporary lighting purely to right. cover if turf two is taken offline so that we can utilize the Parker Field. It is not a long-term. It gets a little tricky because there is the the birch meadow lighting and other items. This is this is not a capital item. This is a one-time discrete cost for a very short period of time. If Turf Two is taken offline in order to play the games, we may need to bring in temporary lighting. That is all that that funding is for it is not a long-term solution it is not to light parker any longer than needed for turf to to be repaired it, it gets a little tricky because there's a lot of lighting items being discussed but what we're budgeting for is a one-time very discreet bring them in light the fields take them i didn't know that existed game. so that's what i didn't know if yes it's commonly it's used uh, right now it's Friday night, on right? saturday nights yes. when uh, for slide football. Thank you. So that was not to confuse with the larger capital mm -hmm. discussions that are going on. This is a very discreet purpose. Thank Did you. Do you want to answer the solar question? Yeah, we've looked at solar and we've, we had, um, well, we looked at it with you and um, this, th we don't have a lot of real estate on the rooftops of our buildings and the, um, we do utilize solar domestic hot water at the two fire stations to heat the uh, hot water for the living quarters over there as well as at the police station. And we have a solar preheat here at the high school that heats the space right here, which is a, a, a solar wall, we call it. It's a preheat. It's up on the top roof facing the pack. But um, it, we don't have a lot of real estate on the roofs of the buildings because of the amount of equipment that we have on the roofs of our buildings. So. And we've we've looked at different options. So, thank you. Any no? All right, keep going. Yep. I think that's pretty much that it. Yeah. That's pretty much it. And then we got capital. All right. You want to start that? So for the capital, this is. Um, proposed capital that is currently in the capital plan that was presented at town meeting in October. So from a high level standpoint, from a school standpoint, standpoint, as we've discussed, we are going through and replacing the phone systems at the various schools. This year we are doing Wood End, which is actually currently underway. I think the work started uh, the beginning of this month. Next year, we will be looking at Birch Meadow, and what this is allowing us to do is align all of our phone systems. As part of it, we're also looking at the bells, the PA system, and the clock, so we're basically upgrading across the district over the next several years. We have the $100,000 capital budget for district-wide technology initiative, so Julian and I are in the process of working through what that would look like last, next year. Last year we did the wireless throughout the district. Um, we've done some of our backup systems. So each year we look at district-wide technology and the best utilization of that funds and then we would come back and report on that. From a facility standpoint, Joe will do a much better job at this than I will, but we meet regularly throughout this process I think some people think we might sort of look at the capital plan once a year, set it aside. I think this has almost become a weekly, monthly discussion and meeting that we have. So one of the items we have annotated on here, which um, Joe will do much more credit than I will on this one, is we did have funding on there under the HVAC energy management systems for Coolidge for $225,000. In discussions as we review the capital plan, looking at what's needed and when, in discussions with Bob as we're going through this, we are most likely going to recommend that we push this out a year based upon looking at the overall capital needs 
of the town and what this was geared towards. And one of the rationale for that is as we're moving forward with the turf two proposal, we're looking for areas in which we can move items around within the capital plan in order to fund some of these larger capital initiatives. Right. So we have money at the, um, for under HVAC, we have money in, in barrows to replace uh, some split systems over there, which are the ductless splits uh, in two areas over there. Uh, Joshua Eaton, that $14,000 you're looking at is exhaust fan replacements for 14 grand. Uh, the Wood End School, uh, again, that is more exhaust fans over at that location, okay? Those are getting to us, believe it or not, they're getting there. Um, the Coolidge is the $225,000 placeholder. So I, we had talked about this a few minutes ago. So th that building has um, two steam boilers that were in installed in 1999. Um, and the back section of the building, I'll call it, 20% of the footage is, is on the um, a, a, st a steam to hot water converter, which is not really the most energy efficient way to do, to, uh, to actually heat the back section of the building. So what we propose, what we were proposing to do, and again, this has nothing to do with uh, a, a potential breakdown or a need to do it immediately, but it's a cost savings measure is what it boils down to, is to take and install a high efficiency condensing boiler for the rear section of the building alone. That way we don't have to run those uh, giant uh, steam boilers to heat that section of the building. It makes more sense to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And that's why we feel if we had to move something, we could move that out there. All right, because it's not something that's looming over our head that's gonna break down. I, mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but um, on any of the equipment, but we feel like that would be something we could do and do it in the future. Mr. Robinson. What, what's the break even on that in terms of? On the, on the condensing, well the condensing boilers I believe running around 85 to 90 percent efficiency compared to what we have. So I could get you that information. I could tell you that the, since we've gone with the um, condensing boilers at Birch Meadow, as well as the Josh Wheaton, we've seen a decrease in our consumption, our energy consumption there. I could get you guys breakdown if you wanted to see it. I think when we get to the point where we're actually funding it in terms of just right. putting it in. Because yep. right, it would be interesting to look at what the decrease per ther of therms per square mm -hmm. footage was at Birch Meadow, like, and sort of compare that to that. Mm -hmm. Might that be what you expect to get mm -hmm. if you do this at Coolidge? Yep. Might knock that back from that point seven yep. nine seven. The last item that I, I think I skipped over on the school side, which is a combined school facilities item, is we are proposing to replace the courier vehicle. It is right. 2007 vehicle that actually was a repurposed driver's ed car. So it's definitely, <laughs> we have definitely yeah. gone. We used to have the, the brake and everything. Uh, yeah. we, we do consider it the Flintstone vehicle, I think, for Dick Cross probably uses his feet to stop it. It may not have heat anymore. Um, so we are looking to replace that next year. And that is a placeholder that we would obviously go through the mm -hmm. proper procurement process. Any other questions? Any questions from um, our dedicated viewers and audience here? I think that's the last piece of the budget for tonight. Yeah, so just a, just a couple of uh, final points. So um, any budget questions that the committee um, would like us to answer, we would ask that they are submitted to us by the 18th at noon time. That would give us that's, Friday, that's a Friday. That would give us sufficient time um, to answer, to have them ready for the 24th, which is when we would answer those questions for you. Great. And, and then, uh, for the 17th, we're going to be, um, there it is, it's a slide. On the 17th, we're going to be um, presenting the regular day in special education cost centers. And on the 24th, we're also going to talk about the re revolving account. We, we have a few slides we can show you on the revolving, yes. After, after the hearing. And then the 28th will be the vote. And currently, we don't have any other items on the agenda. Are we all set? A motion to adjourn. Dr. Boxer? A motion to adjourn. Second.
Second it. All those in favor? Great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.